London is widely regarded as the centre of the FX industry, the world's largest market. It's therefore fitting that as Cybos 2019 gets underway in the UK capital, it begins with FX Day. There are six Cybos sessions dedicated to the FX industry, exploring regulation, data transfer, fintech, and the impact of China's renminbi, among others. And we're joined now by Gavin Wells, an FX and financial services consultant at Accipitrine Consulting Limited. He's hosting two of the Cybos FX sessions. Welcome to Cybos TV, Gavin. Thank you both very much. Thank you. Well, Tell us about your experience and indeed your view of the FX industry because it is a pretty big industry, especially here in the UK. It is indeed. Um, my experience, uh, I joined in the 1990s, just when Britain fell out of the ERM. Good timing with Brexit coming up. Very good timing. Another <laughs> coincidence. Um, and I spent 15 years trading currencies at a big American bank. And then I joined um, the London Stock Exchange Group and we built um, a sort of gamekeeper no, poacher turned gamekeeper, we built a clearing service for currencies, something that this week will focus on a lot. Um, and from there, I went to work at a fintech, looking at the application of blockchain and smart contracts to post-trade processes of all the asset classes. Sounds a bit grim, but it'll come to life as right, we Right, but on. basically, you've been there, seen it, and done it. <laughs> Quite a long time, 26 years. I know I look younger, but yes. <laughs> I was going to say. Thank you. So how important is the FX industry in the global banking community? Whether it's enabling um, cross-border flows, global trade or foreign direct investment, or whether it's being used to hedge or to fund um, or to make payments or to generate alpha, to, to make profit. Um, I think of FX as the oil that keeps the wheels of finance going. Um, a little bit biased as I've been in it, but that is what it does. Uh, so FX is really important. And if you understand that SWIFT, who runs Cybos, are essential to the confirmation and settlement of foreign exchange, the end bit where the money changes hands, then aside from the similarity of the world's biggest market and the world's biggest conference, I think it's pretty appropriate that FX is at Cybos and we'll see it for quite a while to come. What are the key issues around FX liquidity? Would you say you touched on it earlier? Mm. There was a survey last week, it comes out every three years and it says how big FX is. It's a really important survey and it's trusted. And FX is bigger than ever, and they say that the size, the turnover, is a rough proxy for liquidity. So that says FX is really liquid. But if you talk to people in the markets, they would tell you that um, increased cost and capital has meant they can't get access to the markets in the way that they want. So two disparate sides. What's clear is that um, market participants are trying to address any issues with liquidity because it's in their benefit to have a smoother, more operational functioning market. I mean, look, there's, there's plenty going on, plenty which forms yeah. a talking point in itself, but let's not forget the dangers. And I'm thinking particularly about the risk to the financial ecosystem if, for example, li liquidity dries up yes. for a specific currency. I mean, how do you deal with that or potentially anticipate it if you can? Yes, that is an enormous risk. Uh, uh, at one end, if liquidity dries up a little, you can't hedge or fund. At the other end, you literally cannot make a payment and you would be in default, bankrupt. Um, and if the liquidity is sustained, a drop in liquidity, that can have macroeconomic effects on the underlying economy. That can change the economy of a country. Um, the central banks are, um, have always been very engaged in listening to markets as well as supervising and operating them. And after the financial crisis in 08, a group of them got together and they, they established some swap lines. And what that means is that one central bank can give the currency of the other central banks to the people in its region in times of stress. Those swap lines have been the underlying stability for liquidity in foreign exchange, rarely invoked, but they have meant that any shortages that we see are typically short-lived. Mm, you can actually deal with them in, in advance effectively. Absolutely, yeah. How does the, the correspondent banking network fit into this? And, mm. and for how long will the FX industry continue to use it to settle FX trades? Okay, it's a fairly niche thing. So briefly, what is it? When you settle foreign exchange currencies, they've got to end up in a bank account with the central bank of that currency. And you've got to use a system called real-time gross settlement system. Um, and that's supported by a company called CLS. And CLS um, net and settle $2 trillion a day. So central banks and CLS. But to be a member of those, you've got to be a certain um, regulatory status. 
and there are costs and obligations appropriate for the, for the resiliency that they offer, and not everybody wants that. So a lot of people use their correspondent bank and ask them to settle for them. Okay, so what's the future of that? Um, the regulators are concerned at the size of the correspondent banking network um, and want it to be ever stronger, of course, and the correspondent banks are looking at that, uh, at improving what they do. But if you take the survey that came out last week and you subtract the figures of CLS, the, the main entity in the market, there's about $3 trillion a day left over. That's a lot of money that's going through the correspondent banking network, and that's not going to change until someone develops something that's safer, faster, and better, and that's yet to happen. So I think it's here for a while. I mean, without being disrespectful, you are a banking veteran. I mean that in the nicest possible way. I mean, you. <laughs> but you, you've seen a lot of changes. I mean, you talked yep. about being there when Britain dropped out of the European exchange rate mechanism. So much happening, particularly as we plan for a post-Brexit world. So given all of those factors, mm. do you think that London will continue to be the centre of that FX trading business? So clearly biased, um, sitting in London, um, but being pragmatic. There are worries that post-Brexit we're out of the European Union, we're not a member anymore, and that will have its challenges. But FX has always worked really well across borders, across jurisdictions, laws, regulations, with no hiccups. So this should be no different post-Brexit. So then you look at the convenience of London. We straddle the time zones perfectly, that's why it's become so big. London has 43% of the foreign exchange market. When you think it's a global market, that's phenomenal. It's a big slice of the pie. And then the work London's doing with China to support the Chinese economy, the trading of their currency, the renminbi, all humour and bias aside, I do believe London will remain the centre of FX for some time to come. Can you give us an insight into how fintechs are planning to transform the FX markets? Yes. Um, so in my, thank you for highlighting it, very long career. Um, <laughs> distinguished long <laughs> career. Distinguished, distinguished long career. <laughs> Most of the focus has been on um, before you buy something, pre-trade, pre-execution, making it faster, making, the, making it smarter for us users. Um, and then recently the focus has been on cryptocurrencies, but the central banks are now looking at that, witness the Facebook discussion. So fintechs are looking in the middle, and they're looking at things like dynamic credit allocation, which is really cool, I know it doesn't sound it, but it makes best use of the credit, like reweighting all your credit cards at, at one time. Um, it's going to look at um, harmonizing post-trade flow, so great efficiency, particularly inside banks. A trillion dollars a day is transferred just within banks between their legal entities, and if you could net that and reconcile it efficiently, that would bring huge savings. But the golden goose, the holy grail, which they're looking at is how do you digitize a central bank-backed or fiat currency. And if you digitize it, you can then achieve atomic delivery versus payment or payment versus payment, i.e. really fast payment in a really safe way. That's the golden goose. That's what a lot of people, I think, tomorrow will talk about. But those three models are the main ones, and I think we'll hear more tomorrow. Exciting times ahead, Gavin. It's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. A fascinating you. world. So look, thank you so much. Enjoy your Cybos as well. That was Gavin Wells of Accipitrine Consulting. Thank you. Thank you.